I was raised in the church and I'm socially awkward, so vocal feedback is always good. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about teaching. And one of my first times teaching, which was back in 2015, where I was team teaching Introduction to African American Studies at Columbia University. And in her essay, The Voice of the Children, June Jordan writes quite beautifully about teaching Gwendolyn Brooks. So this is also about what it means to teach Gwendolyn Brooks in a time of crisis. And then I'll read a poem about my dad. I open the semester's final session with news of the non-indictment. Only days removed from walking the streets in protest for hours, the name Eric Garner, a sharp and common song in their mouths, the faces of the students in my introduction to African American studies course collapse in defeat, weighed down by sheer exhaustion. We spent the first few minutes talking openly about how we were processing the news, allowing our despair, our rage to linger in the classroom. Eventually, we turned toward our reading for the day. Gwendolyn Brooks's second sermon on the warp land. The lines lead us elsewhere. From my first day teaching a course on lyric poetry and the personal essay to a group of 13 year olds six years ago, to the academic environments I find myself most frequently these days, i.e. seated amongst a group of teenage poets in Chelsea or standing before a classroom full of graduate students at Columbia University, the questions I am asked most frequently have remained more or less the same. How did we get here? Has it always been this way? How do we stop the bleeding? In response to my students' concerns about the role of literature in their pursuit of a more equitable society, I do my best to create a classroom that also functions as a writing workshop, a space in which we might think together toward a radically different world and also sketch out as vividly as we can a detailed vision of that alternate set of relations. Through the use of various compositional approaches and performance practices I've honed in my career as a poet, I try to enact a pedagogy that emphasizes creativity and collaboration, one that urges my students to consider the work we do together inside of the classroom as inextricable from the change they seek to implement outside of it. This approach to educational practice reflects three central tenets of my teaching philosophy. One, a critical embrace of the unknown. Accident, Edouard Glissant writes, is the joy of poetics. Following Glissant, I would add that accident is also one of the great joys of teaching. <laughs> one of my strategies for creating an atmosphere in which we treat accident as an occasion for thought is that I often have my students free write at the beginning of each class session, often using a short poem or prose passage directly related to our reading for the day. This practice of writing together quietly at the beginning of each class is, for me, not only a way of grounding us all in the present and thus allowing the students time to transition from the stress of their lives on campus into the classroom, but also a practice of growing comfortable with one's capacity to make mistakes. And for those of us teaching in the present, this is quite common, right? It's often about the right answer or kind of deliverable. To misspell or let an inchoate idea linger on the page. My approach to teaching a poem like Second Sermon on the Warp Land depends largely on such an environment. Students, in my experience, invariably struggle with how to read enjambment or what to make of Brooks's allusions and layered imagery. When they feel comfortable asking if Brooks is referring to Bessie Smith when she writes, quote, Big Bessie's feet hurt like nobody's business, but she stands bigly under the unruly scrutiny in the poem's fourth section, and whether that even matters or if they wonder aloud who Bessie Smith is in the first place and why they have never heard her name before. It opens up space for us to talk about the conditions from which the poem emerges, as well as how we think about the relationship between song lyric and the lyric moment of a poem, which is also to say the irreducible bond between black letters and black music. When we do the difficult, dangerous work of thinking together, it allows us to delight in the opacity of the material before us to embrace what we do not know or cannot yet perform without coming up short. It requires that we rely upon one another. It demands that we improvise. Two, caring for the whole student. 
The opening lines of the Brooks poem, I remind the class, are notes for both theory and praxis. This is the urgency. Live and have your blooming in the noise of the whirlwind. The urgent living Brooks describes here, the kind that blooms and flourishes despite the death-dealing forces that surround us all, is a guiding force of our practice. From their free rights to their online discussion posts, my students are encouraged to incorporate everyday experiences into their analysis of the course material. Many of the young people I teach view the classroom not only as a means through which they might acquire knowledge, but as a space in which they can be reckoned with as full, dynamic human beings. In fact, most students come to my office hours and do not want to talk primarily about quiz grades, believe it or not, or final paper topics, but about their experiences of isolation and exclusion while living on campus. For the vast majority of them, both office hours and the classroom itself serve as a kind of refuge, a rare venue in which they can articulate a critique of the violent structures around them without fear of being cut off or shut down. What's more, these students constantly deploy such critiques using both the vocabulary they have gained access to during the course itself, employing terms like patriarchy and stereotype threat to describe phenomena they've known bone deep their entire lives, as well as far less formal language when it comes time to give an account, to tell the truth of their experiences as it feels most natural. The practice of making room for my students to utilize the classroom in this way, as well as my commitment to joining them in this approach to making sense of the text we explore together, is to my mind a practice of care, of being alongside. In the sort of learning environment I hope to foster, there is no simple division between thought and flesh or text and experience. We bring all that we are into the classroom with us. Three, education as the practice of dreaming together. My foremost goal as a teacher is to push my students to linger with what they have been taught is unworthy of study, to question all that they encounter, and to take the skills we have honed in the classroom together out in the world so that they might unsettle it. A recent example of this practice is when I asked a group of students to write down their vision of a future without prison and share it if they felt comfortable doing so. The responses ranged wildly, and within minutes, the room filled with other freer worlds, every one audacious and lovely in its own way. So often, in both their writing and classroom commentary, the students I teach voice their desire for something akin to a deliverable or action item, a concrete step they can take to repair the world around them. My message in this vein has been a consistent one. We may never witness the actualization of the world we desire, but we must nonetheless be willing to risk our lives for the sake of its very possibility. As Brooks reminds us, we are the last of the loud, and thus always in danger, but also living at the right time to act courageously. In the midst of a moment marked by gratuitous, unremitting violence, I thus encourage my students to think of the knowledge they produce in the classroom as instruments for living, to take the writing that emerges from our time together and put it to the use of facilitating both discussion and political action within the spaces they inhabit both inside and outside of the university. When we take the time to read Gwendolyn Brooks, Harriet Jacobs, Lucille Clifton, June Jordan, and numerous others, we do so because they give us the tools to imagine what we have been taught is unthinkable unattainable. This is the very core of my teaching, a commitment to thinking the unthought alongside these young people, to carving out space for us to dream up what we might not yet have the words to describe. Indeed, it is this final matter, the task of imagining a viable language, a viable future for the people I love, that reflects the true stakes of my aims as an educator. On this front, I always find myself thinking about Toni Morrison's timeless hero, Sixo, from her Pulitzer Prize winning novel, Beloved. A man who stopped speaking English, Morrison writes, because he saw no future in it. The overarching aim of my practice is to labor alongside my friends, colleagues, and students toward a language we can see a future in. To examine its syntax, its formal limitations, and give that song to the air. What's more, my classroom is intended to serve as a space for these students and the authors they are engaged with to collaborate in the name of a more capacious human vision, one we have crafted together on our own terms, though always with an eye towards the writings and teachings of those that came before, 
always honoring the cloud of witnesses whose work served as our condition of possibility. A radically different set of relations is possible. As Morrison, Brooks, Jordan, and others demonstrate, such an order is already here, already in the works, already waiting for us in the whirlwind. Thank you. So, since we were, I wanted to say aloud, but since we were encouraged to read poems, I'm gonna share a poem quickly about my father. Because part of what I think is so important teaching in our contemporary moment is to go over histories that we might take for granted. Um, so in that same classroom, I had a student ask me uh, if Malcolm X was a slave. And I remember just thinking in that distinct moment, what, well, one, oh man, like I have some stuff I need to cover, like a lot of ground we need to cover very quickly. Because then that, that means your vision of the United States of America, its imperialist project, the sheer distance between 1865 and 1965, all of that is blurred for you, and it means you haven't been taken care of in a certain kind of way. So I'm asking you to forward a radical critique, and we really need to be talking about like the Civil War. you know. Um, and so this is a poem about my father who integrated his high school um, in the late 60s, uh, and in so many ways is not just a sort of a living textbook. He also fought in the Vietnam War, and met my mother at a house party, which is cool. I think it's why I love the music. Sort of all, all poets or painters or musicians, you know, and I, I lean toward the latter. So this is for him. It's entitled America Will Be, after Langston Hughes. And uh, after this, I'll take my seat. <clears throat> I am now at the age where my father calls me brother when we say goodbye. Take care of yourself, brother. He whispers a half beat before we hang up the phone, and it is as if some great bridge has unfolded over the air between us. He is 68 years old. He was born in the throat of Jim Crow, Alabama, one of 10 children, their bodies side by side in the kitchen each morning, like a pair of hands exalting. Over breakfast, I ask him to tell me the hardest thing about going to school back then, expecting a history I have already memorized boycotts and attack dogs, fire hoses, Bull Connor in his personal tank, candy paint shining white as a Confederate ghost. He says, honestly, having to read the Canterbury Tales. <laughs> he says, eating lunch alone. Now I hear the word America and think first of my father's loneliness of the hands holding the pens that stabbed him as he walked through the hallway, unclenched palms settling onto a wooden desk, taking notes, trying to pretend the shame didn't feel like an inheritance. You say, democracy. And I see the men holding documents that sent him off to war a year later, Motown blaring from a country boy's bunker as napalm scarred the sky into jigsaw patterns, his eyes open wide as the blooming blue heart of the light bulb in a Brooklyn basement where he and my mother will dance for the first time, their bodies swaying like rockets in the impossible dark. And yes, I know that this is more than likely not what you mean when you sing liberty, but it is the only kind I know or can readily claim the times where those hunted by history are underground and somehow still daring to love what they cannot hold or fully fathom when a stranger is not a threat but the promise of a different ending. I woke up this morning and there were men on television lauding a wall big enough to box out an entire world. Families torn with the stroke of a pen, citizenship, little more than some garment that can be stolen or reduced to cinder at a tyrant's whim. My father knows this, grew up knowing this, witnessed firsthand the fire bombs, the clan, multiple messiahs love soaked and shot through, somehow still believes in this grand blood-stained experiment, still prays that his children might make a life unlike any he has ever seen. He looks at me like the promise of another cosmos. And I never know what to tell him. All of the books in my head have made me cynical and distant, but there's a choir in him that calls me forward. My disbelief, built as it is from the bricks of his belief, not in any America 
you might see on network news or hear heralded before the start of a football game, but in the quiet power of Sam Cooke singing that he was born by a river that remains unnamed, that he runs alongside to this day, some vast and future country, some nation within a nation, black as candor, loud as the sound of my father's unfettered laughter over cheese eggs and coffee, his eyes shut tight as armories, his fists finally unclenched as if he were invincible. Thank you.